Let's start very basic here. Okay? Now, I gotta, I gotta have a disclaimer. This way of teaching happens best in the tutorial. And so I'm going to wait until you've been through that first tutorial before I build on that tutorial and teach you the way I like to teach. Now that means I got to wait because you're not taking tutorials, some of you, until Wednesday morning. So today and on Monday, I'm going to give very traditional lectures on circuits. The type of lectures that you would get at one of those lesser schools like Stanford. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it'd just be fresh out of, or, or straight out of a, any kind of a, a standard textbook. And then, Wednesday, once everyone's been to that tutorial, Don Gage Lowe's, then I'm just not going to hold back and I'm going to start teaching the way it was meant to be taught. Okay? So let's just do a basic discussion of circuits. You've all opened up a flashlight and you know that there's batteries that are stacked in what we call a series, uh, you know, positive to negative, and there's a bulb, that's why we call it a flashlight, and then the whole purpose of the flashlight is to create a complete path from one side of the battery to the other that passes through the filament of the bulb. And this switch, when you close that switch, it completes that, that path. Now the fact that I need a complete path implies that something is flowing around that path, okay? Now we don't typically draw a flashlight that way. We draw a schematic, a schematic diagram where we use symbols to represent the pieces of the flashlight. Now in that schematic, the battery, you've seen that symbol before, the longer line is the positive terminal of the battery, the bumpy, the bumpy end of the... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you that the bumpy end of a, of a battery is the positive end, but uh, the last three years on my uh, exams, I've had to make that announcement during the exam. The bumpy end of the flashlight is the positive end. <laughs> you should know that by now, okay? <laughs> grown-ups. Okay, <laughs> now the filament of the bulb is a resistor. We'll talk more about resistors a little later on. Uh, and then we've got of course this switch that can break the flow or complete the circuit. Now we're going to start basic. We're going to start with simple problems, but it's not going to take us very long before this is our homework. And I can give you seven identical bulbs. By identical, I mean they were made on the same day by the same worker at the same factory. And I'll hook them up to that battery and I'll ask you, which of those bulbs is the brightest? Which is second brightest? Which is third brightest? <coughs> and you'll be, very, you'll, you'll be able to very easily say, number one is the brightest. Number seven is the second brightest. Number six is the third brightest. Two and three are tied for four and four and five are tied for last. More importantly, you'll be able to give your reasoning for that ranking, which will be half of the points on the exam. And it'll just seem obvious. It'll just seem obvious. Now, to get started, let's uh, take a pretest, see where we're at. In this pretest, there are five bulbs. And I want you to predict which is the brightest bulb, which is the second brightest bulb, which is the third brightest bulb. <laughs> because I already know what it'll tell me. This is one of the most famous pretests that there is in physics. For many, many years, uh, Lillian's research group has been giving this all over the country, and then it became popular and it started to, be, to, to show up in different countries. Um, wherever we give it, we always find the same result. If you give this pretest to a bunch of engineers that are taking the calculus based intro class, the geeks, and if you give it to them post instruction, 
after they've had all the lectures and all the homework and everything they're going to have on circuits, 15% of them will get this right. If we get it, give it to a class of non-geeks, of uh, uh, pre-meds and, and uh, biologists, uh, those of you that are in this class that's not calc-based, what we find over and over again is that 10% of you will get this correct. Now, there was one time when we had a very different result than that. Uh, Lillian McDermott was asked to give a workshop in the great state of Texas for a bunch of science professors. We had physics professors, chemistry professors, earth science professors, uh, biology professors. And she did this workshop, she gave this precast, 17% of them got it correct. What we find over and over again is that people do not have a gut level model of what's going on in a circuit. Um, years ago, I was attending a conference in Canada, and uh, many, many years ago, and Eric Mazur from Harvard was giving a talk. And his talk was entitled, What Do Our Students Know About Electric Circuits? Well, I was working with Lillian at the time, Lillian McDermott, and we all thought, well, dang, who is this guy, Eric Mazur? Uh, and this is what we do, this is what we study. So we went to his talk, and what we found when we got there was Eric Mazur was there, was there in a, a white three-piece pimp suit. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was just decked out, and he started his talk by explaining why Harvard was the most prestigious, the best university in the world, and hence the universe. And then he started listing his teaching awards to, to establish that he was the very, very best teacher at Harvard, which made him the best teacher in the universe. <laughs> and we were starting to hate this guy. And then he said, so when I heard about this pretest that Lillian McDermott was giving all across the country, I said, not my students, not my students at Harvard. And so he tried it, and he was surprised to find that his students did not understand basic circuits. They could work very, very complex mathematical problems that suggested that they might understand circuits, but when he asked them simple questions about what's actually going on, they knew nothing. And that's what we're trying to fix. By the time we get done with this section of the class, every single one of you will be able to look at any circuit, any messy circuit, and make sense of it. It will just make sense to you. Was this talk, okay. was this talk any good? What's that? Was this talk any good? The talk was great, and it turns out he became one of the greatest advocate of, advocates of physics education research in the country. Why? Because he was from Harvard, and when he spoke, the White House listened, everyone listened, he has gone uh, and given presentations that, that Lillian could never give because of his affiliation with Harvard. He is... So he chose not to go to Harvard. Don't down it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to start our traditional discussion of circuits by talking about current. And current is just the flow of charge. Now... When I think of the flow of something, I, like the flow of a river, it's got to go somewhere. Now when I'm measuring this current, what I do is I set up a lawn chair right there. And I get a counter like one of those breeders at Walmart. And I draw a red line across that wire. And every time a coulomb of charge goes across that line, I click. Another coulomb of charge goes across that line, I click. Another coulomb, I click. The number of clicks per second, per unit of time, is the flow. If I use the definition here, if you replace delta T with one second, the current is just how much charge in coulombs goes across that red line. Okay? Now, Here's the thing, we measure current in amps 
And that, that unit was defined first. Because an amp is a perfectly reasonable amount of current. If you've got some kitchen device that's got a motor in it, like a blender, it's going to have about half an amp going through it. Unless that device has a heating coil in it, it's always going to have some fraction of an amp going through it. And so an amp is a reasonable amount of flow. But because of that definition, we're stuck with our definition of the Coulomb for charge, which is a huge amount of charge. And that's just because that's how much charge goes past that red line in one second in a typical household device. Now, here's the thing. Ben Franklin, Uncle Ben, did us a huge disservice when he called the charge on the negative, on the rubber rod negative, okay? You remember that Ben Franklin thought that this charge was an invisible substance that you were either putting extra on or you were taking off. Now the invisible substance, it turns out, was electrons. And when, when Ben thought he was putting extra of this on, like he thought he was putting extra of this stuff on the, the glass rod to make it positive, that's why he called it positive, it had extras. What he was really doing was taking electrons off. And so we got it exactly backwards. Now if we look at any wire, it's neutral. It's got just as many positive charges as negative charges. Even if I have a huge current going through this wire, it's still neutral. It's not charged, it's neutral. It's just that the electrons are moving through the, the lattice work, through the, uh, the metal. Now, we typically play a game. Instead of thinking of, of the electrons going one way, we make believe that positive charges are going the other way to get rid of a whole bunch of minus signs. In other words, that would represent a wire. And I have just as many positive protons as negative electrons. Now, if an electron were to move to the left, that makes that positive charge look all by its lonely, okay? And if the electrons keep moving to the left to fill in the gap, that looks like the positive charge is moving the other way. Now, there's only one experiment that I know of that can tell me whether it's electrons moving to your right or whether it's positive charge moving to your left. We call that the Hall experiment. It's hard to do. We're never going to do it. So for our class, it really doesn't matter whether we think of it as electrons going one way or positive charges going the opposite way. Now it turns out, trust me on this, we're going to be much better off if we do what the rest of the world does and talk about conventional current. Conventional current is we pretend that this wire is a plastic tube and that positive charges are going through that tube, the opposite direction that the electrons are actually going. <clears throat> Physicists do this, electrical engineers do this, the electrician that comes to fix your, your socket at your house does this, everyone does this to get rid of those minus signs to make up for Ben Franklin's mistake. Now how do we measure current? Well, we put a lawn chair here and we draw a line well, this is our lawn chair. Our lawn chair looks like this. We call it an ammeter. Now, to understand how an ammeter works, you need to understand magnetism. We're going to study magnetism. We're going to, the last tutorial, you're going to actually uh, look at the guts of, a, of an ammeter and understand how it works and predict uh, which way the coils go. But for now, it's just a lawn chair, and, and it counts charge. Now, if I have this bowl hooked up to the battery, we can think of either electrons leaving the negative terminal, going through the bulb and coming back 
to the positive terminal, that's what's really happening, or what everyone in the world does is pretend that conventional current positive charge is leaving the positive terminal, going the other way through the bulb, and back to the negative. Now, if we want to measure that flow, we have to actually break the line. We have to break the line, turn off the bulb, and make that current go through my ammeter. Now look at the brightness of the bulb. Is it different with or without the ammeter? No. no. Not much. Pretty much the same. And that's what you expect from a good measuring device. You don't want your measuring device to change what it is you're measuring. Now, what does that tell me about ammeters? Is it hard to get those charges to go through an ammeter? No, it's very, very easy. It's, it's like it's not even there. We say that an ammeter has small, actually negligible, resistance. We'll talk about resistance in a, in a little bit. Okay, but it's just the obstacle to the flow. Okay. Now, we insert that ammeter in series. And by series, I mean the current has to go through the ammeter. All the current that goes through the bulb has to go through the ammeter. There's only one path. Okay? Now, what drives the current? Well, you know the answer to that. It's the battery. Without the battery, you're not going to get any flow. We call that the electromotive force. Years ago, uh, at my birthday, some friends gave me an old textbook. Uh, it was a physics book written by a very prominent uh, physicist. And it was a book that was intended for physics teachers on how to teach physics. And I just love the chapter on electromotive force. It starts out, tell your students quickly the name and hope they forget. Because that name is misleading. This is not a force pushing charges around the circuit. It is not in any way a force. It's just historically, we called it that, and I wish we had not. What it is, the battery acts like an energy pump, uh, driving current around the circuit. The EMF is how much energy the battery gives to each coulomb that goes through the battery. Any coulomb that goes from the negative terminal to the positive terminal is chemically handed, if this is a 12 volt battery, it's chemically handed 12 joules of energy. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what that means, okay? It's not kinetic energy, okay? In other words, when the charges come into the battery, they're not all, oh, I'm so tired. And then they come out the other side, oh, like they just had an energy drink. No, it's like a boulder at the bottom of a cliff. You look at it, it's just sitting there. You move it to the top of the cliff, you look at it, it's just sitting there. You take a picture of it at the bottom, you take a picture at the top, it doesn't look different. But the boulder at the top of the cliff doesn't want to stay there. It wants to get to the bottom of the cliff. And that's what the battery does. It takes a coulomb, like a boulder, and puts it where it doesn't want to be. And then that coulomb tries to get back where it wants to be, back to the negative terminal of the battery, back to the bottom of the cliff. And in doing so, it goes through the bulb. Okay? It's just like gravitational energy, but it's electric potential energy. Electric potential. The kind we were talking about at the exam last Tuesday. Okay? Now, this is measured in joules per coulomb, or volts, and it's just the battery voltage. Now, for historical reasons, because we've typically called the battery an electromotive force, we often label a battery with this symbol epsilon. But it really should just be a delta V, a delta V, okay? Now, 
If I measure the voltage across that battery from A to B, what I find is the voltage is 12 volts or 12 joules for each coulomb. And that's this, this idea of taking that coulomb and putting it at the top of the cliff. If I measure the voltage across the bulb from C to D, what I find is that I get minus 12 joules for each coulomb, or minus 12 volts. And what I interpret that as is that I give each coulomb 12 joules of potential energy here, and it loses that energy in the bulb. It doesn't lose it in the wire because it's easy to go through a wire. There's no vert required to go through a wire. But the filament of a bulb is hard to get through. That's high resistance. And so it has to do vert to get through that, that, that filament. And that's where we change that energy, that's electric potential energy, into heat. And then if it gets hot enough, it starts to glow. If it gets hot enough, it glows red. If it gets hotter, it glows white. And that, that's what causes the bulb to help you find your tent. Okay? This is the cartoon that I want you to carry around with you. Each of those balls represents a coulomb of charge. And the darker red the ball, the higher the electric potential energy it has. And it just goes around. You can think of those coulombs as dump trucks. They go through the battery, and as they do so, they pick up 12 joules of energy. They take that 12 joules of electric potential energy, and they deliver it to the bulb. And then those dump trucks go back for more. Now, here's the thing. It's the energy that is carried to the bulb and used up, not the coulombs, not the current. If I were to put ammeters here and here, they would read exactly the same thing because I've got the same number of dump trucks going past every second. It's just that these dump trucks are at a low energy, these dump trucks are at a high energy. But the number of dump trucks per second, that's the current that we measure. I call that the what goes around comes around principle, which typically is associated with gossip. In a small town, eventually you'll hear it. Okay? See if your neighbor's on the bus so far. Let's not lose anybody. We've talked about current, and we measure current with an ammeter measuring amps. We measure voltage, and by that I mean voltage difference, with a voltmeter, which looks a whole lot like an ammeter. And we're going to find it has very, very similar guts inside. But there's one very important difference between a voltmeter and an ammeter. When I connect it, I don't connect it in series like I did the ammeter. What I'm looking for is a voltage difference from A to B. And since this ammeter has two leads, danger, danger, Will Robinson. You're too young. Okay. If I want the voltage difference from A to B, I touch one of these leads at A and one of them at B. So I come in here and I touch it on one side of the bulb and the other side of the bulb. Now since I've got wire connected to those sides of the bulb, I could also just hook it in there and there. Now watch the bulb while I connect that. Did the bulb get dimmer? No. No, it did not. It also didn't go off while I was connecting it. When I'm connecting a, a, an ammeter, I got to disconnect it. I got to break the line and shove it in so that all the current flows through the ammeter. 
but the voltmeter just takes a trickle of the current, a trickle of charge. In other words, I'm hooking it up in parallel to that bulb, and I want most of the current to go through the bulb. I don't want to change the brightness of the bulb, so I just take a trickle of the current out, and I measure for that trickle of current how much the potential energy changes. And that's how I get the voltage. Now, think about this. If all the current has to go through this guy, and that doesn't change the brightness of the bulb, we said that this guy must be really, really easy to get through. This guy is hooked up in parallel. The current, if you look at it, either has to go through the bulb or through the device, through the voltmeter. Not both. It has to choose this or that. And we want nearly all of it to choose this one. So is this going to be easy to get through or hard to get through? Hard, hard. hard to get through. This has a huge, huge resistance. Um, and and that, that is a principal difference between a voltmeter meter and an ammeter. Huge resistance. So let's consider a simple circuit. If I have more batteries in series, the bulb gets brighter. I have more current flowing. The bigger the voltage, the bigger the, the push, the bigger the current. I also know that if I go down to the hardware store, I've got all different kinds of bulbs I can buy. I can buy a 40 watt bulb, I can buy a 100 watt bulb. And they glow differently. And I'll also find, if I use my ammeter, that I get a different flow through the tube. And so that means that not all bulbs have the same flow through them. The same push is going to give me different results depending on what I hook up. Now, in this class, on homework and on the exams, we will always use identical bulbs made at the same factory by the same worker on the same day. But I, I, I talk about this to introduce the idea of resistance, which is futile. <laughs> You know what this is, right? Right? Okay, some geeks in here. This is the board, right? If you don't know about the board, there's a homework assignment for you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about resistance. Resistance is just that. How hard it is to get this charge to flow through something. Now, the way I measure resistance, uh, thanks to Georg uh, Ohm, is with this definition here. Set this current equal to one, and that tells you what resistance is. If I want to know the resistance of this pen, what I would do is I would change the voltage difference across the pen. I would ramp that up bigger and bigger and bigger. And when that voltage difference was big enough to push one amp through the pen, that voltage difference would be my resistance. That's how I would define it. If you set the I that's passing through the pen equal to one, then the resistance is equal to how many volts it takes to get that to go through. Now for many materials, most materials, um, we find, oh, I should say, this unit, volt per ampere, or volt per amp, we call the ohm to honor a dead professor, okay? And I, I just got to pause here and point out that you've seen a whole lot of really homely uh, scientists. But that is one handsome looking scientist. I think we'll all agree, right? That's, I mean, he could be a count. <laughs> now, <laughs> What we find is that many materials have a constant resistance regardless of, of how hot they are, regardless of how many amps are flowing through them. And we call these materials ohmic. Now, when something is ohmic, 
we typically use this definition as a law, and it's called Ohm's Law. V equals IR. Now when I say V equals IR, I really mean delta V equals IR. And I can't say this law without um, chuckling a little bit. When I was an undergraduate, there were just 10 of us in our class. We took all the classes together, one after another, semester after semester, until we got to our senior year in quantum. And then there were 11 of us. And that's because there was one student, his name was Eric, and this was his third or fourth time through quantum. He just never could get through that class. And I took it as my personal challenge to get him through that class. And it turns out the physics department didn't want him to, to graduate. They didn't want him to pass that class. Because Eric was in charge of our electronics shop. And any broken equipment in any of the experiments, they brought to Eric. And he quickly fixed them. He could fix anything. Now, because I was trying to get him through this class, he was often at my house, late at night, working on homework. And I remember one night, I was tired, and I was just getting frustrated, and I said, Eric, buddy, it's not that hard. I mean, you can fix all that electronics. That's hard. He says, oh, shucks, Greg. He's from Tennessee. Shucks, Greg. Electronics ain't hard. All you got to do when something's broken is you just shake your finger at it. And you say, V equals hour. V equals hour. V equals hour. <laughs> it turns out he's right. <laughs> that is the secret to solving all electronics problems. V equals R. V equals R. This is the F equals MA of circuits. It solves every single problem. And it wasn't until years later that I finally realized that, dang, Eric was right. <laughs> v equals R. Now, when you say that, it's really delta V equals R. Okay, delta V. Okay. Now, which of those has more resistance, the steel or the wood? Wood. Do so. Wood, good. What if they're both steel, but one's twice as long? The longer one or the shorter one? The longer one. If you don't believe that, take two straws that you get down at the, the sweet shop, and you blow through the straw, it's hard to blow through. There's resistance. If you take those two straws and put them end to end, it's even harder to get the air through because it's got to go through both straws. Now, what about this? I got a fat steel cylinder and a skinny one. Which one's the greater resistance? Which one's more resistant? The skinny one, the skinny one. Now again, if you got those two straws, put them right next to each other in your mouth and blow them. It's like a great big fat straw and it just goes right through. It's easy to get the air through that, low resistance. Now, the formula for resistance looks like this, where this rho symbol is a constant that's different for each substance. There's a, a value for copper, there's a value for uh, wood, there's a value for platinum. It tells you how hard that substance is to get charged through. Now, at MIT, they have a, a tokamak, that's a toroidal device that uh, is used to heat plasma and create energy. It was called Alcator C. And this was the device that they achieved break even on, that they created as much energy as they had to put in. But they had to put a huge amount of energy into the device. It had these coils in the plasma, and those coils were hungry. They needed a lot of current. And so when you would bring visitors to the Alcator C, the first thing they noticed was that there was a great big metal I-beam coming in from outside the building, right through the center of the great big hall, right into the middle of the device. That was their wire, okay? They had to bring a lot of current in there, and so instead of using a wire like this that would melt down, they used the I-beam off of a, of a skyscraper. And then they had plexiglass around it 
so that you know the grad students wouldn't touch it, <laughs> that sort of thing. Now, I got a question for you. Is the Earth a good conductor, yes or no, with your clicker people? Greg. Greg. Did he pass? What's that? Did he pass? He did. He graduated with us. <laughs> The answer is yes, and the key word in this question is the. If you just talk about earth as in dirt, like a bag of dirt, that's a very poor conductor. It's very hard to get current to go through uh, a bag of dirt. But if you take a spike and you put it into the ground, into the dirt in Bozeman, and you put another spike into the dirt in Belgrade, there are so many different paths by which the current can go from Bozeman to Belgrade that essentially you have an infinite area. And that means that the Earth, because of that area, cross-section area, acts like a huge copper ball. And that's why we talk about grounding our experiment. Typically we take our experiment and we attach it usually part of the experiment, like the negative lead of the battery, we attach to the nearest pipe, water pipe, because that water pipe is going to go down into the ground and it's metal. And that will connect our experiment to this great big huge copper ball. And that means that the same experiment in France that's grounded to their nearest water pipe is going to be connected to the same great big copper ball. What do, we, what do we know about the voltage at different places in a metal? It's the same everywhere. It's an equipotential volume. And so that means the voltage at the negative terminal of my experiment is the same as the voltage at the negative terminal of your experiment. We're comparing apples to apples. Okay? Now, here's another question. What is constant for a battery, voltage, current, or both? two main groups there, and one of those groups is getting it, and one of those groups is still confused, okay? Now, when we go and buy a battery, on the battery it says, I'm a 12 volt battery, or I'm a 6 volt battery, or I'm a 1.5 volt battery. It never says, I'm always going to give you 5 amps. No, it, it brags about its voltage. And a battery, if it's ideal, will always, always, always have that exact same voltage that it brags about from its negative terminal to its positive terminal. Now, the most ideal batteries that we have in real life are rechargeable batteries, NICAD batteries. And a NICAD battery, if it says it's 1.5 volt, by golly, come heck or high water, no matter what you hook to it, it's one and a half volts. An alkaline battery, it says it's one and a half volts, and it'll try to be one and a half volts. But if you start getting a lot of current going through it, it'll just curl up and die. <laughs> and it's not the physics that's failing, it's the chemistry inside. It's always the chemistry that fails, never the physics. Okay. <laughs> now, if I take, if I take a six-volt battery, 
and I hook it to two ohms of resistance, that's fairly easy to get through, by V equals IR, that's going to give me 3 amps going around that circuit. If I take that same 6 volt battery and hook it to a resistance that is 6 times bigger, I get a current that is 6 times smaller. What goes around that circuit depends on what's in the circuit. Now you know this is true, you've seen this in everyday life. If you go out to your car battery and you grab both terminals with your hands, just grab the positive and the negative with your hands, what happens? <laughs> Nothing. You've got enough resistance in your body that there's not going to be hardly a trickle that's going to go through your heart. You'll be fine. <laughs> Have any of you ever dropped a wrench across the terminals? Only once, right? You never do that a second time. If you accidentally drop a wrench across the terminals, that wrench has so small a resistance that you get a huge flow. A flow big enough that potentially it could spot weld that wrench to the terminals. Then you're really in trouble. Then you're going to have a, a, a mess. <laughs> Now, that battery can either give nothing or it can give a gusher, depending on what you connect to it. And that's the idea that you need to, to keep in mind when you get to that tutorial, is that it depends on what the circuit has for resistance. The more resistance we have in the circuit, the smaller the current through the battery. Okay? Now, uh, that's a good stopping point. We'll pick up on Monday. Have a good weekend, people.